Hello everyone, welcome to your next chapter. In this one, we are going to be talking all about these things called Markov models, and then we're going to model a specific kind of Markov model called a hidden Markov model. Wow, I said model a lot of times there, didn't I? Well, don't worry about that for now. What we're gonna do in this class is I'm going to introduce you to what this thing called Markov processes are, exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about hidden Markov models, and then trying to give you some scenarios or ideas about how these kinds of models work, when they're appropriate, and why you'd wanna use them, okay? So Markov models come from a very long history of probability theory. Uh, it's essentially a type, it's not, a, it is cons what we're going to be doing is considered an unsupervised method for it, but you can kind of consider Markov models to be very different than a lot of the other types of uh, learning that we have learned previously. It will be more similar to the types of processes that occur in random forests. If you kind of look back now and think of all the different types of uh, learning models we have we have gone through. Uh, random forests seem to be uh, the most different or have a completely different approach in, to dealing with how to uh, make decisions and learn from data. A hidden Markov model is going to be closer to that vein in terms of its conceptualization and what we're actually trying to extract from that information. So first off, why don't we start with a list of definitions. First off, so uh, firstly, a Markov process, basically what we're doing is we have a sequence of uh, events or states. Uh, the example we can use is whether or not to go outside to play sports uh, given the weather or certain uh, values of the weather. Uh, so if we are in a state of going to sports, we can have some information of like whether it's, you know, foggy or sunny and we can use all of that kind of information to determine the likelihood that we are going to be moving from one state to another either continuing to play sports or to move on to not playing sports and so the probability of moving from state to state given uh, some information or time uh, we we build these kind of probabilities around. And we'll show you a visualization of what that looks like. But the probabilities that are built around the likelihood to stay golfing versus the likelihood to transition to another state, like not golfing or work or something, these probabilities all sum to one or 100%. And uh, the transition probabilities for a Markov model are essentially a large array of the likelihoods that a model will move from one state to another. Now remember that Markov processes uh, are kind of, in, uh, each event is independent. You kind of use the information you know about the past to inform a future event, and that these uh, different types of information tend to be independent from each other. Meaning that, uh, you know, the, how a state moves is not influ is only influenced by the the factors that are involved in making that decision, or at least in the data that we have. Okay, so the next slide we have under cost function, again, not really the best way to um, represent this, this, this information. However, this is uh, what we're talking about when we talk about a simple Markov process. So what you're seeing here are three circles, one, two, and three, and you're seeing arrows going both to the state. We, this is, would be our state, so we could say that like one is not golfing, two is or foot, like, sports, um, two is not sports, and three is work. And we can say that um, the pr if we look at this state one and look at where it's pointing to, we can see that the, tr the probability of moving, if you are already in state one, moving to state two is 34%. The probability of moving from state one to state three in the next uh, if in the next state or the next iteration is almost 60% and there's about a 6% chance of uh, this uh, of staying in this state here in state one. You'll notice that for state two, it doesn't have any probability of returning back to itself. It only has a, it's only, it basically, if you're, if this is state two, if you're in state two, there is a 0% chance of staying in state two 
for this Markov chain. This is a this is the Markov. Uh, this would be considered a simple Markov chain. And the Markov process in this example is showing like how um, how you can think about moving from state to state over time. You will notice that the sum of the arrows that are pointing out uh, from a state sum to one because there isn't there can't be a hundred percent hundred and ten percent chance of doing of moving from one state to another. But the probability of states coming in does not have to necessarily sum to one. So it's really the transition probabilities sum to one when we're going from one state to another, but not uh, not to a state. It's always from a specific point. Okay, that's basically how the Markov process is working in this illustration. So uh, why don't we now go into our syntax section and start talking about uh, another example of this. Okay, everyone. So in this example, I'm going to craft our own Markov chain so that we look. So we had that original image, and I was kind of describing what each of the numbers are. But let's actually kind of create our own example and uh, see what we can do from there. So first off, I'm going to create an example that has three. Um, that has four states. One, two, three, four. And each of these states is going to be. Um, basic, we'll do this with weather. So, well, no, let's not do this with weather because weather is going to be the same every time. Let's do this with something like, um, uh, you know, uh, mental states, happiness, sadness, you name it. So state one, state two, state three, and state four. And so we'll say that one is happy, two is sad. Three is angry, and four is um, afraid, fear. Okay. So uh, in this example, we'll say that um, the likelihood that if you're happy and you stay happy, this would be a generally happy person, is about twenty percent. The likelihood that um, you're happy and Let's actually put this a little larger. Let's make this positive. This will be this will be four percent. So we'll set this to point four or forty percent. The likelihood that uh, you go from happy to fearful, we can say, is pretty high. We can say at point two because, like, oh, I'm I'm so happy that this is scaring me or something. A happy person. Uh, this this happy person. So this person's emotional Markov chain is not going to have. Any probability of going from happy to angry? If they're happy, they're just happy. And then sometimes um, this individual like goes from happy to sad very quickly. So in this case, this state is going to be 0.4. And so there's basically, uh, if this person is happy, the highest likelihood is that they're going to either stay happy or move into sadness in their when when their mood changes next. Let's now uh, talk about. Um, Anger. We'll go up to anger here. We'll say that ang person never stays angry for long, so we don't have any backwards. Um, uh, it doesn't. It won't stay into this state. But um, person can go from angry to sad very, very often because they feel regretful or something. Or they can. will go from angry um, to happy. And because they're angry to happy, that's something around 0.2. Like they, they, you know, they got their anger out in a very um, healthy way or something. So it makes them health happy that time. And uh, occasionally they become afraid because I don't know, maybe their anger got them into trouble or something like that. And we're gonna build this for all of these states. All right. So we'll have four to two. So from fearful to sad, we can set high. Stay fearful. We can set to, um, you know, 0.3, and then we can have going to 3 at 0.1, and going to 4, or going from 4 to 1 at 0.1. And remember, all of the states moving from all the transition probabilities are the all of these numbers. Okay, the 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. We need these transition probabilities, or at least we need to. We're either trying to approximate these transition probabilities given some state data that we're going to receive. Uh, so uh, with our hidden Markov model, we can either 
<clears throat> our, our regular Markov model, there are two ways to go about this. We can either give um, our model the transition probabilities ahead of time or some hypothetical ones, and then feed into it some states, like some data, and it can give us the likelihood that um, those states occurred, like the sequence of events happened. Like, let's say we were passing in some data about a, about a person using a mood tracking app or something, and it's what we pass in as data is uh, their their mood uh, given, uh, you know, uh, that they were tracking it. So like some daily mood counters. So this is their mood at, at every 24 hour period. So we could calculate the probability that this sequence occurred in our Markov model and produce some sort of percentage likelihood. I don't think it'd actually be 73% in this case, it'd be much lower. Or we can give it these states and a bunch of them and it can derive the transition probabilities. The examples that we're gonna be talking about in our coding section are usually going to include some of this information. This is one of the trickier things about using hidden Markov models. It turns out um, in order to, like scikit-learn started to have a hidden Markov package, but they realized that it was beyond the scope of what they were trying to do and kind of the models that they were generally providing. And so they built a whole separate library called HMM Learn. And so basically what I'm trying to tell you with all of this, guys, is that how we build hidden Markov models is going to be a little different than how we're building other models. We either have to feed it the states that we suspect it's going to be, and then we can give it, uh, uh, or feed it the transition probabilities rather that we expect it's going to be, and then uh, feed into it a state and we can get some likelihood. We could uh, build a model that then uh, says, okay, well, you know, give it a bunch of states and uh, adjust adjust parameters according to the transition probability likelihood, or we have to give it a bunch of these different states as data and, and have it learn the transition probabilities therein. Okay, so you can see how this might actually be, uh, well, one last thing. Um, these discrete values, these states here, like one, two, three, four, um, are a most common way to describe the Markov models in the simplest way too. However, you don't necessarily, these could be continuous values. They don't have to be discrete labels. Uh, we're going to only work with discrete labels in this chapter, but um, the point is we want, I want to show you um, the conceptualization of Markov chains and Markov models, why they might be useful for what you're doing, uh, or like what kinds of things are useful in terms of the problems that they're, they're, they're addressing. So uh, in the next class, guys, we're going to talk about hidden Markov models where we have a state and a, all, a bunch of like latent variables, like some other pieces of data that influence the likelihood of moving from one state to another. We call these hidden variables. Uh, so, um, you know, you'll have these states, you'll have some transition probabilities, but there's kind of like a, an extra, a hidden layer that is influencing uh, the outcome of whether or not it moves from one to another, okay? So uh, with that, let's just do a brief review. So in this class, guys, we we gave you a couple of, uh, we introduced you to the concept of Markov processes and Markov chains. We described how basic Markov processes work with three and four state systems for like the very simple versions. And I introduced to you a little bit about the concept of um, hidden Markov models. So we'll uh, work on those in our next class. With that guys, thank you very much and see you then.